No one today can doubt the importance of the Supreme Court of the United States of America. It touches every aspect of our lives and every part of our country. The Supreme Court is the third pillar of the federal government. It rebukes presidents and Congress. Its decisions are often in the news. Nominations of new members are always in the news. But it wasn't always so. The status of the Supreme Court when Marshall joined in 1801 was unloved, disrespected, and often ignored. He was the fourth Chief Justice. Nobody remembers the work of the first three. Marshall took it and made it into something that was uh, a co-equal branch. It was under his leadership that the court became a significant player. At its finest, the Supreme Court has been a bulwark against tyranny and popular passion. And John Marshall was the man who made the Supreme Court. John Marshall is the greatest judge in American history, critical to America's formation. But his formative experiences came not in court, but on the battlefield. Like his fellow founding fathers, he was shaped by the revolution. His vision of America and of the need for a constitution, a vision to which he dedicated his life, was forged in the fires of war. The two men in John Marshall's life that were formative were George Washington, his founding father, right, and then his father. So this is the county where John Marshall was born and grew up. That's right. He's born in 1755, and this county is formed four years later. Uh, but this is the formative place of, of his youth. So he's, he's practically frontier, you'd say. Not just practically frontier. I mean, it's actually frontier. Okay. This is. This is the edge of civilization for British North America right now. As a man in his 70s reflecting back on, on his life, he says he grew up in a time when love of the Union and resistance to Great Britain, or the claims of Great Britain, were the inseparable inmates of the same bosom. The importance of the war in shaping his outlook for the rest of his life cannot be underestimated. So this is where he would have left to join the militia. That's right, in 1775, 19-year-old, this is where he would have essentially strode into American history. To go in service of an idea of political liberty and self-government, this is a, a major decision that you're going to take up arms and become a traitor, which, if this fails, uh, you will be hung. And then the Continental Army. This is Valley Forge, the military camp where George Washington and his army suffered through the winter of 1778 after the British captured Philadelphia. They didn't have supplies. They didn't have much food. And yet, Marshall was the best-tempered man, his cabin mate would say. This is the worst experience in American history and your cabin mate is saying you never complained and you were telling stories and, and just holding people together, you get a sense of, of what kind of person Marshall was. But you also just see a natural leader. He's also witnessing George Washington holding together the army at Valley Forge. It's a horrible trying experience, one in which Marshall appreciates firsthand in his bones the weakness uh, of, of the government at the time. At Valley Forge, John Marshall saw a revolution hanging in the balance. The lessons he learned here would last a lifetime. What Marshall papers do you have? Well, we have an account book of his. Like many of his contemporaries, Marshall destroyed most of his personal papers before his death. But deep in the archives of William and Mary College in Williamsburg, Virginia, are letters and documents that offer an intimate view of the great Chief Justice throughout his lifetime. 
Here's a document in John Marshall's hand uh, when he was serving with the Virginia militia during the revolution. It shall be the duty of commanding officers of companies at every muster to inspect the public arms. Yeah, so if the soldiers weren't up to uh, snuff when it came to their inspections, they could be uh, fined not exceeding $2. All it's right. clearly in his handwriting, but it's... He has no legal training, but he's, he's literate, it. of course, and, uh, and smart as a whip. And so he's able to digest the laws of war and to administer military justice as a deputy judge advocate general. He learned the way lawyers in those days tended to learn by doing, by apprenticing, by, by doing actual legal work in the, uh, in the army under Washington. At William and Mary College, John Marshall received his only formal legal training, six months of study under George Wythe, America's first law professor and a mentor of Thomas Jefferson. Wythe wanted to instill in his students the values of being well-rounded. Mm -hmm. So they didn't just read legal treatises, they read other books in the humanities, they practiced moot court, they practiced in the moot legislature, and also... The idea behind it was to create citizen lawyers, to create people who would lead our nation into greatness. John Marshall was in that early class of statesmen, the first alumni of George Wythe, the first of young lawyers to lead a nation. I believe it was sort of a win-win for him to study under with because he had met a lovely lady in Yorktown, which is not very far away. This way he could spend the summer studying under the famous George Wythe and also getting to know Polly Ambler a little better. She and the other Ambler sisters are hearing about this strapping uh, Captain Marshall who, uh, from, who's writing letters uh, to his, from the front to his dad. John comes into town, and he is not the Greek god that they uh, had, had figured. He's sort of uh, awkward, he's tall, he's gangly. Williamsburg was the capital of Virginia for most of the 18th century. Here, in the rebuilt governor's palace, I've been invited to an annual event that takes us back to 1781, when Thomas Jefferson, Marshall's cousin, was governor, and John Marshall was courting Polly Ambler. Marshall himself was on inactive duty after the 1778, 1779 campaigns. Polly caught his eye. She was only 14. The Governor Ambler Jr., His Excellency, Mr. Thomas Jefferson, let the rebels commence! John Marshall is Thomas Jefferson's cousin and the relationship between these two men will dramatically impact America's development as a nation. Balls were where the elite of Virginia socialized and where their children looked for wives and husbands. Polly Ambler, not quite 14, had never laid eyes on Captain Marshall, never even been to a ball. But her sister wrote, she set her cap at him and vowed to eclipse us all. What came from this dance was the love of his life. This is actually a law school notebook that he kept while he was studying law to George Wythe. Uh -huh. And what I find so interesting is that on one of the pages, this is about the writ of a sumpsit. Rather dry. Yeah, but, um, what? but as you can see right yeah. here. Ah, that's not a legal term. No. Polly Amber. Polly Amber. Polly Amber. Right here. Polly. You can just imagine John Marshall taking notes or either studying, and she's maybe wanted to spend time with him or uh -huh. stop studying so much, and so she's stopping him and jotting her name down. Maybe he's daydreaming while he's studying and thinking of her. Or maybe she wrote it one time when he was sleeping or the book was off to the side. And so when he did start studying, he would think of her. John and Polly Marshall moved to Richmond in 1784, where the young lawyer sets up his first law practice in the new state capital. 
Historian Charles Hobson brings me to the Richmond house John Marshall builds soon after his marriage to Polly. We only know about it from Marshall's point of view through 45 letters, all of them addressed to my dearest Polly. It was clearly a love match over many years, and they probably spent a lot of long winter's evenings reading to each other. John Marshall exclaimed that his wife had a real talent uh, for reading aloud and assuming the voices and dispositions of various characters. When he talks about, we used to beguile those long winter evenings. I love that word, beguile. This was a room where Marshall had his famous lawyer's dinners. He liked to entertain. He thrived in, in, in masculine company. But Polly would suffer a miscarriage and lose three of her 10 children by the age of 26. The uh, ordeals of childbirth and the tragedies that occurred affected Polly greatly. Those events caused Polly to spiral into to some type of depression that she stayed in for the rest of her life. With his law practice prospering, Marshall enters public service, elected to the Virginia House of Delegates in 1787 as a staunch Federalist. Federalists were the people who were, wanted a stronger national government that felt that the Articles of Confederation weren't powerful enough really to hold the states together and to accomplish what they thought a central government had to do. The Articles of Confederation, which preceded the constitution of the new nation, had been a pact between the states. The Articles of Confederation had no executive or judicial or uh, common legislative functions with the power to tax and to defend. All of the states were sovereign, and the Anti-Federalists believed that they maintained that sovereignty. Federalists disagreed. They insisted that we, the people of the United States as a whole, have the sovereign power. In Philadelphia, delegates from across the country are forging a new path for their new nation. From May to September in 1787, a shifting cast of 55 men would write a new constitution for the United States. John Marshall knew a lot of the men in this room. His law client, George Mason, would oppose the Constitution at the end and refuse to sign it. Alexander Hamilton, his comrade from Valley Forge, would sign and would argue for the Constitution in the Federalist Papers. It's so striking to think of these men who came to Philadelphia to debate the Constitution and of the personal dynamics among them debating people who disagreed strongly during the day about fundamental questions like the nature of federal versus state power or slavery and freedom, led by a few distinct individuals, many of whom had known each other and grown up with each other. The presiding officer of the convention and the most important delegate was the man Marshall had obeyed for five years, George Washington. He was the first to sign in his large rolling hand, and he would lobby vigorously for ratification behind the scenes. The new Constitution is controversial, and many oppose it. In the Federalist Papers, Hamilton and his colleagues argue passionately for its passage. Nine of the 13 states must ratify it for it to go into effect, and Virginia, the largest, is a must-have. Marshall throws himself into the fight for ratification there, while his cousin, Thomas Jefferson, now America's ambassador to France, is much less enthusiastic. He believed in the American nation, but he believed it was a nation of states. The Jeffersonians feared that the Federalists really wanted to reestablish a monarchy, the very, the very thing we had overthrown in the, uh, in the Revolutionary War. Many people considered Virginia to be the epicenter of what comes to be known as the Jeffersonian Republicans. And Marshall was a Federalist in Virginia. Thomas Jefferson and John Marshall had a very complicated relationship. There was a sense of mutual respect in that, in the way that uh, maybe two tigers uh, in, a, in a cage would have some mutual respect. They were opposites politically, uh, really for, for, their whole, uh, for their whole life. 
This political difference between the two cousins will only grow, but there are personal differences too. Marshall served in the Revolution. He was at Valley Forge with his men, and Jefferson was not a soldier. I mean, uh, in that day and age, it counted for a great deal. The ratification of the Constitution was controversial in Virginia, and the ratification and debates in Virginia are a wonderful microcosm of the competing arguments for and against the Constitution. Marshall was a nationalist. I mean, he really believed in the American nation. When a lot of other people had trouble conceptualizing America as a nation, not just a collection of individual states, but a nation, Marshall could see it. The Jeffersonians feared a very strong central government, one that would crush the rights of individuals and would crush the authority of states. When you think about what happens in 1860 when you have a civil war that is very much a continuation of this battle of uh, whether you're going to have state sovereignty and state power versus national sovereignty and national power. It was this fundamental political difference, of course, that ultimately translated into the political party system in the early period. Were it not for Washington's shining reputation, the fact that all the delegates from North and South acknowledged his greatness and his neutrality, the convention would never have been successfully summoned and the Constitution would never have been ratified.